Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. I'm your host, Jared Moon. The Garage Gym Athlete Podcast is a result of my desire to build better humans, unequivocal coaches, and autonomous athletes. I've spent the last several years obsessing over program design, nutrition, and every other way you can optimize human performance. This podcast distills the latest scientific research with what I've learned and blends it with the not-so-scientific field of mental toughness. We are here to build you into a dangerously effective athlete. If you enjoy this podcast, you can find out more about our training at garagegymathlete.com. And if you want to pursue more into the field of coaching and programming, head to endof3fitness.com. Thanks for listening. All right, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Jerry Moon here with Joe Courtney Kaushram and Ashley Hicks. How is everyone doing today? I think pretty Fabulous. good. Fabulous. Great. Doing great. I hope. It's cooler here, so it makes me happier. It looks like it's yes. going to rain here. Joe, mm-hmm. still hot with a side of sun? Yeah, but I didn't have to <laughs> ring out my headband today sun. during workout, so that shows Ew. progress. That's a huge plus. Oh, no. Yesterday was like four times I had to, I had to ring it out. <laughs> yeah. So gross. That's pretty crazy. All right. Do they have permanent sweat marks on it? Um, no, but for a while there, I had a, a little bit of a tan line. And when we went out to like uh, to the beach one day, my my just my forehead got super burnt because it never is exposed <laughs> anymore. Well, speaking of sweat, um, yeah. yeah, this is episode uh, 120, Hydration and Supplementation. This is part three of three in our Warrior Fueling series, Weekend Warrior feeling series yeah uh so pre- mm. prepping you for your races longer <laughs> events or even training sessions that you're doing how do you prep for this we've covered carbohydrates we've covered uh, protein fat is that everything mm-hmm. yeah so, yes so now we're diving into hydration which is really important if we're going to be talking about these things and then also supplementation um so yeah i don't have uh, i mean i have a lot to say but i don't have a lot to prep us for saying I think we'll just jump right into it. If you're, if you go to the study in the uh, in the show notes that we link to, it's section three point four. We'll talk about hydration first, and then we'll jump into supplements. There are one, two, three, four, four total supplements they mentioned, and then we'll talk about recovery, nutrition, and concern with high carb high carbohydrate diets. Uh, but let's jump into hydration. Um, what were the takeaways from any of you on hydration? I think for hydration, sometimes it can have as important as it is, it can be a little bit more overemphasized to some people. And I think sometimes people can think, Hey, I'm just going to drink a bunch of water and it's going to make me do this workout and perform. But it's like, yeah, you need water, you need salt, but it's, it's not going to be this magical thing. So I think, and especially for our athletes, for the regular workouts and training, if it's a one hour workout, you should be focusing your hydration outside of the, the gym and the workout. Um, during the day, throughout the day, when you may, when we first wake up, but like, even as hot as it is here, I don't even bring water to the gym. Like I, they have a little fountain and I do those little cone cups that I'll do a, a couple splashes of, but really even that I'm sweating, as I said before, ringing out my headband, but because I hydrate throughout the day and I make sure like after the workout, I'm drinking water, getting my salt, wake up in the morning, have some water. It's fine. But since this study was about, um, an actual event like endurance events longer duration that's when you should okay if i have my hydration dialed in for training then i think i should just take that what i was uh doing and just kind of try and keep keep at a, a certain level and not try and overhydrate as we go and i know other people are going to dive into the overhydration because that was one of the takeaways of the study mainly but that's just i think i just wanted to hit on the um mindset i guess the how you, how you should strategize with uh, hydration and the fact that you're probably the like, most endurance athletes when they finish races, they're going to be de- dehydrated. And, uh, I also read this in, you know, for performance wise, I read this in another book, um, that had to do with recovery and other, other stuff, or maybe we've covered somewhere, but when you are in a race, when you're doing or running, doing something for a while, exercising for a while, your temperature raises and finds a new baseline, a higher normal t- higher temperature baseline and drinking water, the more you drink water, it actually lowers 
your body temperature and it's actually throwing off your heart rate and your recovery and it can, can um, affect your performance. So the more you drink can actually make your performance worse because it's messing with your body temperature, not necessarily hydration. So that was another aspect of over-focusing on hydration and drinking a bunch of water while you're doing stuff when you probably don't need to, but I will pass it off to Kyle. Yeah, I think there's a lot, you know, you're talking about body temp regulation. You know, there's a lot of uh, climate factors as well that you have to take into consideration when you're doing an event. You know, if you're doing an event, if it's going to be hot, if it's going to be rainy, if it's going to be cold, you know, what are you what are you going to be dealing with climate wise that you need to uh, that you need to prepare for? And the way that you hydrate should be part of that as well. You should be hydrating to compensate for those types of things. Um, if you're going to be racing in a hotter climate, you're going to need to hydrate more, but you need to hydrate more before you need to be adapted. It needs to be part of your training where you're hydrating during it. But um, it, the study really covers this prevailing idea that people have had for a long, long time of you can't overhydrate. You just have to drink all the time and drink and drink and drink and drink. And they said, no, actually there were studies done for people who did that. And it actually put them in a, a, a highly compromised position in um, almost deadly, a deadly type position for some people who are overhydrated. And so um, your hydration should be individualized to you and based on your body type and your weight and all the climate factors that are going to be surrounding the event that you're doing. So, um, lots of stuff there about how to, how to hydrate properly, Ashley. Um, and then to kind of just piggyback off of that is the type of race that you're doing, right? So, right. um, it has to deal with length. So you're probably, you know, like we all did the beast, uh, you know, we were probably all at a lower intensity than somebody that is, I don't know, trying to do Fran for time or something like that. Right. So, um, that also has something to do with your hydration and the slower the paces, you don't need as much water. I'm trying to remember too, like, I don't think any of us hydrated at every station. Like I want to say there were certain stations that we were like, we're good. You kept going. Um, for us, I think the salt, I think the salt consumption was a huge, uh, which is a huge deal for us. Like I remember swelling in my fingers very, very fast. And I think I should have taken that as a sign. Too much salt. <laughs> maybe. Yeah, way too much salt. Maybe I should slow down. Um, but I didn't want to, I don't know. I think I was scared to, anyways, we'll talk about salt in a second. But that was my main takeaway for the whole hydration thing was that slower paces didn't need as much water. And um, it makes sense. You know, you're not going through as much did it surprise anybody though that most people were overhydrating versus dehydrating i think because uh, there's such an yeah. emphasis on it i mean I, yeah. I i could see why so it wasn't like super shocking mm. um yeah but i and also because reading about the the body temperature thing and it's just been a big thing yeah. like the yeah. uh, in the in book endure he talks about it and then also crossfit went on this like rampage several years ago anti-gatorade which whatever i'm anti-gatorade too as far as the sugar content but they this whole hyponatremia, which is which is the overhydration. They also talk about in the study, um, and it actually has always confused me. I'm like, are people really doing this? Are people really drinking too much water? And I think it's because none of us are truly in the endurance world, right? We're not like hanging out with right. endurance athletes and doing endurance events. But apparently, it's a very prevalent in the endurance world. So people who are ultra marathon mm -hmm. runners and you know long cyclists and and all these things they're so concerned about being dehydrated that they drink way too much water. And I think for someone mm. even doing a weekend warrior type event is very possible for you to do as well. I think it's very possible for you to be like, Oh yeah, I need to need to really be up on my hydration and I'm going to, I'm just going to drink as much as I can because I don't want to get dehydrated. And what's interesting is if you read through this study, they're making a strong case that like, you'd rather be dehydrated. Like if you had to pick an extreme, You'd rather be dehydrated right. than overhydrated because what, there's nothing that they can do for you in the hospital once you have, have passed the point when you, of like overhydration. Like uh, once mm -hmm. that, like you will just die. Like that's what will actually happen if you consume too much water. They can't get water out of you. They can't do anything. If you're dehydrated and you show up, they slap an IV on you. They pump you full of liquids and that's actually an easier one to recover from. But you don't, that doesn't mean you want to be dehydrated just to, pr right. just to show right. you how um, you know, damaging 
hyponatremia is, and that's what this talked about a lot. It even had a fact from another study. It said in the Boston Marathon, an alarming 13% of finishers had hyponatremia, um, and 90, fin 90 of those finishers, so that's 0.6%, were critical, like critical <laughs> condition or something like that That uh, from it. So that's, that's a big thing. Um, I think one thing that, that my kind of takeaway from what Joe was saying, too, was like hydration is a state. It's a habit. It's a state. It's not an event. Mm -hmm. It's not like hydrated check. Like you just kind of like, and then you're done, right? You, it's just something that it's like a habit. You always have to be working on it. You kind of want to be in a hydrated state. Like if I had a, uh, an, a race or event this weekend, because I tend to be near perfectly hydrated every single day, there'd be nothing that changes for me this week going into an event. I wouldn't drink more water. I would drink the same amount of water that I always do which is normally based off of my physical activity, how much I sweat, and just if I'm thirsty or not. And I normally do track my water to some degree because I have a water bottle uh, that's like, I think it's 25 ounces roughly uh, when I fill it up. And so I just kind of in my head know like, okay, I had four of those, that's 100 ounces. Anything else I drink, you know, that's similar, we'll, we'll add to that. And so that's kind of how you have to think about hydration in general. It's, it's a, it's a state, it's not an event, it's something you achieve. You just have to always kind of be hydrated and look out for being overhydrated. And, and I think that's something I definitely want to hit on for anyone like going into an event. Um, and we could talk about the actual amounts. So I read through all their, all their junk on hydration and sodium <laughs> and it comes out to, it says people, sweat ranges can vary from 0.3 to 2.4 liters per hour, which I think is crazy. That's a huge variation, but we all know some people sweat way more than other, other human beings. So you kind of know where you're at on that spectrum. And it said the average <laughs> sodium sweat content is about one gram per liter. So every liter that you lose, you're losing about one gram of sodium. Uh, and so the ideal intake um, I broke it all down is going to be about 14 to 28 ounces per hour, depending on, let's just go ahead and say your size and your sweat level. So take both of those things into account. If you're a five foot seven male, who's like, you know, 145 pounds, 150 pounds or something like that, it's going to be very different than a six foot two, 220 pound male, and especially your sweat rates. But if you're that smaller guy, or girl, and you sweat a lot, that's something to take in consideration, but you're not, you don't have both. You're not larger plus, you know, heavy sweater. Uh, so just take that into consideration in this range. So if you're on the lower end, you'd be closer to 14 ounces an hour. The higher end would be 28 ounces per hour. And they kind of confirm things that I've read that your body, your kidneys can't really process more than about a liter of water uh, per hour. And it actually goes down a little bit during exercise. Um, so that much, 14 to 28 ounces of water per hour during the event with 300 to 600 milligrams of salt. And that, again, the salt range there will also be based off of if you're a heavy sweater or not. And you would just kind of know. You, you, you'll probably know if just having worked out with other people or known other humans, whether or not you are a heavy sweater or not. So just keep that in mind. And really, if, you're, if you have like one large bottle of water with uh, noon is a supplement I like, that'll hit you'll hit the sodium intake and the amount of liquid you need right there. So that, that goes, I mean, I hopefully I didn't steal any other points that you were hoping to make, but like, that's kind of the main takeaway, 14 to 28 ounces of water per hour with 300 to 600 milligrams of salt or sodium. And I think that's something as well, that the reason why so many people have been in the endurance world have been suffering from this is because that's pretty much the whole strategy is just the whole strategy is drink more water. You're not drinking enough. Whereas this study does a really good job of pointing out. No, there's a lot of things that you need to be aware of in order to like fine tune your hydration to you and to what it is that you're doing. And so that's, that's why we highlighted that is so that people can actually fine tune it to themselves instead of just take this drink more water approach. Yeah. Like my hydration middle of the summer working out in the garage in Texas where I'm just sweating like, ridiculous amounts compared to the winter and and you got to be careful with winter that is a place people can get dehydrated but compared to the winter in the garage i'm not going to be sweating near as much as i would in the middle of, mm. of summer and so i take that into account when i'm hydrating but a weird habit i've picked up that i don't recommend to other people i just realized it with my brother is like i don't drink water during exercise i just don't i don't either like, yeah i didn't know if that like i just don't i don't consume a single ounce from beginning of training session 
to the end. And my brother's like over there. He's like, you need some water? I'm like, no, I'm fine. I'm like, whatever. Well, it'll be over. I don't and then think I'll you drink need water. it if you're, yeah. I don't know. I don't think, I don't think you necessarily need it for the hour. And especially if you're, you know, if we're doing like today we did the 500s and I was within, you know, it was zone two, zone three. And I don't know. I don't think you need water for, it just all depends on what you're doing. Well, I right? think it so, becomes this weird crutch, like almost like it's oxygen. Yeah. It's like, oh, in between sets, mm -hmm. right. let me let me get some water. So, you, let me hit you, this. Do you need it? Like, is that? No. But hey, I'm all, I'm yeah. also not going to prevent. Like, hey, don't drink your water. If, you, if that's something you do, then do it. I'm not saying don't do it. Drink <laughs> yeah. drink your water if you need to drink your water. Just look at your overall intake per hour and your overall uh, consumption per day. And we do normally recommend Wait. about fifty percent of your body weight in ounces as the baseline for the day. Um, so I'm a hundred mm -hmm. and whatever, 80 something pounds. Um, <laughs> you know, what's funny about that. So I just always say I'm yeah. 185 when our bathroom, <laughs> when our bathrooms broke in February, um, I don't want to open up a whole can of worms here, but they're, they, they, they broke <laughs> anyway, we had to pack up all of our stuff and, and put it in a storage unit. Um, that was in the bathrooms. Our scale went with that. I haven't weighed myself since February. And so I just bought a new scale. And weighed myself yesterday, and I was 185.4 pounds. <laughs> and so it's just like this odd thing of like people get too wrapped around the the scale thing, right? And I, I think I would Preach. be able to tell a tell. Sorry, that was a, was a weird a variation of the word. <laughs> <laughs> this is a Texas coming, coming out. out. <laughs> wow. I, I feel like I would be able to tell, uh, tell, and. Um, but I, I asked Emily, I was like, does it look like I've gained weight, lost weight, anything? But you can't ask your spouse that. They, they Because we see you every day. Yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. And um, I was talking to Emily about this because I was like, seriously, when, like, when you've been pregnant, I don't even realize you're gaining weight. Like, and we know that she gains weight, right? Like, if we look at a picture before and then at the end of pregnancy, <laughs> she has gained weight. But I never wake up and I'm like, wow, that's... You gain some weight, like you just I, you, it, when, when it happens that gradually, you just never notice. You're a nice husband. <laughs> oh man. Well, I, and I think with William, she she gained quite a bit, and I just like I don't notice it anyway. My whole point was, you don't notice when you when you're like gaining. So I was like a little bit like I wonder if I've you know lost or gained weight, but I've just somehow maintained and break from the scale, people. Yeah, Moral you don't story. you don't break need from the scale. You don't need it. It's not necessary. Preach. But that has nothing to do with um, hydration and supplementation, unless you do. This is the last thing I hit on hydration. We can move to supplements. If you really want to get like dialed in, um, weighing yourself before and after exercise to see how much right. uh, liquid you lost, and you should do it naked. If we're just going to be honest. Um, so for garage gym athletes, that's not that hard of a thing to do. Um, and, and maybe a good, a big pro there. So I'd be interested to see like the differences between all of this. Cause I know you, Jared do not sweat as much as I sweat. Like we've been done multiple workouts and I've got like sweat angels all over your garage and there you've got like little droplets. Yeah. Like, I, I mean, it, it has to be the middle of summer and hot for me to get to like the, my clothes are saturated, but in the winter I'm like, this is stupid. I'm not even sweating. Like I have to use a song. <laughs> I don't like not sweating, by the way. I don't enjoy that. Um, so when I look at my little numbers, I'm medium-sized guy, low sweater. So I have to take into consideration the amount of water and sodium there. I think I'm around two pounds or so from what I've done, just off the top of my head, because there's times you where... You lose two pounds? Like You lose two pounds? Yeah, of water. I mean, that's like working out here. Because like I'll, uh, yeah. I know that I, I weigh myself regularly just because it's in the bathroom and I'm like, I'm always at this one weight, but then there's some times where after I run, I, I get undressed and it, just before I hop in the shower, I'll get on it and I'm like two pounds lower than what I normally always am. So I'm like, oh, well, I guess I sweat about two pounds, but I think tomorrow, cause I'll run tomorrow. I might like officially try it out and see what happens. Have you ever looked at the thing on yeah. the Garmin where it estimates your sweat loss? No. Well, check it out next time. When you finish the event, <laughs> you can like go to the details of the workout and it'll say, estimated sweat loss and it's taking into consideration the temperature you trained in the type of activity you did and, and everything else so wow uh, all right nice sponsor rates. they're a sponsor they're not a sponsor okay suck <laughs> i wish <laughs> i wish you yeah, free garments every year for each team member that'd be awesome um 
All right, supplements. Uh, the only real supplements we're covering, there are four of them. Uh, so we'll break this up into supplements and then kind of the recovery, nutrition, and high-carbohydrate diet. Uh, so the four supplements are nitrates, antioxidants, caffeine, and probiotics. So 3.5, um, we'll start with nitrates. We have talked about nitrates before. Um, what? No. Yeah. So I'm, I did, if we have talked about it before, I pulled up the episode, so I'll start with that, and then anybody on the on the team who wants to go, uh, go for it. But uh, episodes 23 and 78, we have talked specifically about uh, dietary nitrates and how they could help you in exercise and performance overall. So what are your thoughts on nitrates as supplementation for a, keeping in mind, a weekend warrior event is nitrate supplementation beneficial or what were your other takeaways? I said that the positive of this should make you want to consume them. Did you read like the very first mm. paragraph and like everything it listed out that nitric oxide helped them with? Mm. Like, um, so if we always link the study in the show notes, so go take a look at that. But I mean, I can just read a few, um, out loud if I can like figure out where the heck I am here. Uh, but it just says it has numerous bodily effects relevant to endurance athletes, ranging from vasodil vasodilation, blood flow, O2 regulation, and working muscle, mitochondrial respiratory. Anyways, all of this stuff is great. Like, I don't know. So to me, I'm like, why not try to take, again, they talk about beets and beetroot juice. It also talked about um, a higher nitrate diet being a good thing. And where do you find higher nitrate diets from? Oh, yeah, you guessed it. Fruits and vegetables, right? Especially leafy greens. Like, that's the specific one. Um, so my takeaway for this is, like, you can't just eat, like, crap and then try to train for something. You should also take into account, like, I know we're talking about supplementation, but also within your own diet. Like, if you can supplement within like not having to specifically take beets or beetroot juice, which you should, you know, obviously try that out too. <laughs> um, why not trying to get in a decent amount of nitrates with your, with your diet? Um, it said to take the beets and beetroot juice uh, 90 minutes before the race. And the amount though, like three to six beets and then, or 500 milliliters of beetroot juice which I just can't imagine trying to consume that amount of juice right beforehand. <laughs> That's a lot of juice. So they talked about concentrates too, but I just urge people, if you're going to even look into that, like um, to try and get a good supplement of the concentrate that doesn't have a bunch of crap put into it. Cause there's a lot of concentrates out there that have lots of junk in them. I think it's really, really similar to the hydration thing, right? We're talking, especially if you're talking about 500 milliliters of beetroot juice an hour and a half before your event. Like, if you've never done beetroot juice before, if you've never taken it before, don't do that. Don't do it an hour and a half before your event. Just, just don't do that. So we always like, say it to needs to be events, partner. don't change something up on game day, right? Yeah. Never, yeah. Not on, don't do it during PR week or fit week for a PR. Don't do it um, at an event. Like, if you haven't tested it, tried it use it a few times already it's not something that makes its way into your um daily or your your performance you know recipe yeah and with beet reduce specifically here in the study it said it has been studied in athletes have taken up to two to three hours prior to endurance exercise it can reduce oxygen costs during exercise may improve time to exhaustion cardiorespiratory performance at anaerobic threshold and your vo2 max in other words you're going to go farther with less effort. It's going to help you. Like it's going to help you in your performance. So it's definitely, definitely something that, that you need to pay attention to if you're doing these endurance type of events. Um, uh, but again, make sure that you're putting it into your training plan. Like it needs, it needs to be something you're adapted to, something you're used to, not something you're just trying to do on game day. So I've done the beats before. Uh, it's definitely a Jared moment to where like, I don't even care how it tastes. I'll just literally open up a can and just put like two beets in my mouth, eat them and drink the juice straight from the can. It's whatever. Uh, and I've done it and it's, it's pretty good. It's not like not tasting, but it, it does, um, I think help a little bit. Uh, so yeah, I really, all I had was that you should just try it out. You know, it's not really that big of a deal. And it's probably best if you don't get the ones that are in like pickled because that might 
you know, vary on your stomach as well or give you some burps or something. Uh, but if, if you're not about to work out then, and you just want to get adjusted to the beets, then yeah, eat the pickled ones too. Cause it'll be good for you, but that's all I have. I have beets. Yeah. Uh, I mean, my main takeaway, again, we've covered this on two other episodes. Uh, my main takeaway for nitrates were you can get a beet supplement um, or just eat your vegetables. Like Ashley said, uh, here's a quote from the study. It said, in the Larson study, the daily nitrate dose used were in amounts achievable through a diet rich in vegetables, specifically the amount normally found in 150 to 250 grams of a nitrate rich vegetable, such as spinach, beetroot, or lettuce. So if you're having a healthy salad once a day, like you're good you're good like i Mm -hmm. i know in my in my shake i'm having i think it's like around 70 grams of spinach just in one one meal you know and i didn't even think of spinach as a nitrate rich vegetable um i always think of just beets i only i don't think of any green stuff um so if you are and to be honest we're we're covering nitrates antioxidants caffeine probiotics three out of the four of those are just eat healthy be healthy and your performance will will be better for it. So it doesn't you don't necessarily have to be looking at any of these as straight supplementation. Just there are other ways to do it. Like I don't want to get in the habit of buying a beetroot juice powder. Like I've I've tried with I've tried them and ex- experimented with them, but I don't want to have to always buy that to try and be in peak performance. But I'll eat some spinach or salad every single day with enough of it to hit my my nitrate goal. So it's it's definitely effective. It's safe. It's easy to do with just food. So I definitely, I mean, I give nitrates a, a thumb, a thumbs up for performance and something you should definitely try. And like Kyle said, you know, just maybe try it out before you get there. Right. All right. Um, <laughs> the next one is antioxidants. Uh, we've really only covered this once and not specifically antioxidants, but they talk about tart cherry juice in the antioxidants category here. If you want to know all about the magic of tart cherry juice, go to episode 43 uh, where we dive into the science behind that one, but antioxidants, what are your thoughts? Uh, they brought up green tea extract, which I had not heard of before. So that is kind of interesting to me that now I want to, want, I kind of want us to find a study on Same. that because I haven't really heard. I think they linked to a before. bunch. Like I, I want to do an entire episode on <laughs> green tea because they, of the entire antioxidants study, like three fourths of it was about green tea. And I'm like, okay, well. Mm. This one hasn't even been on my radar. I feel like maybe we should uh, should mm. dive into this one a little bit. Yeah, and even like sources as to some places, some of the better places to get the green tea and green tea extract. So, yeah, that's all I got because you know green tea. Uh, I, I drink it. I like the taste of it already. Um, it looked like it had proven and tar- performance benefits, and it helps you burn fat. Like, right, like both of those things. Like they kept talking yeah. about fat oxidation over and over in relation to green tea, and I was like, okay, let's. We'll do it. Which Everyone will, listening, we'll do it. Yeah. We'll find it. We'll do it. Don't worry. Which will help recovery and lower your inflammation. <laughs> but uh, yeah, tartaric juice, we always have some in the fridge. I'll have some with either some, some none, some noon, whatever you want to call it. And, or some, yeah, what do we call like, it? Um, it's, it's noon. noon. Okay. It's Got noon. it. Yeah. The only I like person none. who's ever called it none was Joe. Right. Now. <laughs> I like none. It's N-U-N. You know, like, like none your business. It's uh, two There's two use. U's. There's two of them. It's noon. Okay. I, I like none. I don't care. <laughs> it's like it's one of those things where name. when you read, it. <laughs> yeah, it's like when you read a book and you, you read a character's name and it's like, oh, well that character is this in my head. Then you actually hear somebody say the real name pronunciation and be like, no, no, it's not the name. Is it GIF or Jeff? No. Yeah. Right. I mm-hmm. don't have time for that. But <laughs> yeah. the official, the official name of the company is noon. That's the name that they go by is noon. So there is a right well, answer. I've never heard. I've never heard. I've never talked to them. So. Well, anyway. I say GIF. And I say GIF too. The creator said it's GIF. That's what I heard. The creator yes. called it GIF, but the world says GIF. The creator's wrong. The creator is yeah. wrong. He needs to give the people what he gonna, wants. I'm going to back out here. Let you guys get back into <laughs> antioxidants. Who, who else has that? So yeah. apparently we didn't have time for it. That's... Yeah. All right. But I, I always yeah. drink tart cherries. I think, I think I literally had some yesterday just with some like sparkling water. It's always in the fridge, and we think we have a spare on hand because it's just easy to throw in stuff. And I, I, I like the taste of it too. So, yeah. Sorry, it sounded like you the dodgeball quote. It too. I drink my own urine because it's sterile, and I like the taste. Oh gosh. <laughs> oh, my God. I was like, what? I was like, where are you going with this? <laughs> oh man, that is not. I don't I had, know how you can. I'm not. the one not keeping yeah. us on track today, which is not normal. Yes, it's this is not normal. 
All right. <laughs> Ashley, dig us out of this. <laughs> Anyways, tart cherry juice. Yep. And then they also mentioned leafy greens again. So there's number two, um, as well as dark berries. So again, Jared talks about your smoothies. If you're getting in some good amount of berries with your spinach that you got in that smoothie, um, you're probably, probably good. The cool thing is they recommended it for cycling, Jared, as well as um, multi-stage races. So like triathlons and all all sorts of stuff like that. So um, maybe look into that if you are, you know, gearing up for a triathlon or I don't know what you're doing. Um, Jared stole the fat oxidation, so I won't go into that, but just lower intensity uh, events or longer events. The green tea helps with that because obviously, I mean, we talked about train low, what that means. Um, and then I found it very interesting that it says taken with an additional caffeine supplement was where it was found to be the most beneficial. So I think we all consume coffee. I think Kyle is the only one on decaf though. Um, no, you're not on decaf. Why did I think it used to decaf? be, it used Ever to be since we upgraded his coffee way. game to French. Press. Yes. Oh, that's yeah. right. Okay. <laughs> so I feel like maybe I don't know. Maybe, maybe we're having the most benefits if we just, you know, add some green tea into it. But um, also, again, we're talking about supplementation here. If you're getting a good supplementation, that is what you want to look out for. So not just any Joe Schmo green tea that's over the counter. You probably need to find something organic, something that, again, doesn't have anything that's like added into it. But Yeah, no fall for like of. something having oh. green tea extract in it. You know, that's the annoying, right. annoying part mm -hmm. of all of this. Is, and that's how supplement companies work. They they take one of these studies and then they they're like okay nitrates proven got it throw some nitrates in our proprietary blend and they throw like six milligrams and it's like oh well you actually need two hundred fifty grams of like a, a like a a vegetable to be able to get this and they're like well we don't care there's a study that says that it's there it costs us less to put it in so we got it in there so just if you hear us saying these things are effective we don't mean as a Add on ingredient to some crap that you're you found at GNC or Walmart or whatever. Yep. Yeah, and actually the study here talks about that. It talks about the FDA and like how the FDA is really restricted on like on monitoring dietary supplements and things like that. And and supplement companies really can just almost without any consequences put basically anything they want in their supplement. So and. But we, we talk about that all the time, talk about the quality of the stuff that you're putting in your body. And so just pay attention to that, 100%. That's all, all right. So that's all antioxidants, um, there's a pro and a con. Uh, and so if you take high doses of single antioxidants, may impair or prevent training adaptations in endurance athletes and are not recommended. And so this is something I've always heard for a long time. Um, and it's just like uh, cold therapy. <laughs> Your body's response to exercise is an important factor of gain, gaining fitness or seeing results. So your body's natural response to exercise is very important. Anything you do that blunts that response is typically bad for your results. So we've talked about um, ibuprofen. We've talked about, or did we not? I just read that study on my own maybe. Uh, ibuprofen, yeah. we, nope. we talked about. Talked about it with myself. Did we talk about ibuprofen or no? No, we, we mentioned it on the podcast. We didn't cover the study, yeah. right? I don't think we... We didn't cover the study. No, we didn't think, cover... But we have mentioned so it. So ibuprofen, yeah. bad. Well, we did cover something. What was it? It was... You could take... Uh, oh, it was uh, allergy medications. Um, so allergy medications, mm -hmm. ibuprofen, um, high-dose antioxidants, cold therapy immediately after, like hypertrophy training. You're blunting your body's response to, to exercise. And so that's the only thing that you really need to be mindful of with antioxidants. You don't want to go overboard with them and you might want to pay attention to your timing. So if you're doing tart cherry juice, um, that one, I think, you know, this one seems to be really good for recovery. Um, I, I didn't see a lot of when we covered tart cherry juice, we didn't see a lot of like, Hey, this may blunt uh, your results. I think it's more specifically when you're getting into, and they mentioned like vitamin C and E in large doses, uh, because vitamin C can be a great um, vitamin for recovery overall. But if you're like, hey, just finished um, a long ride or a long run, let's dump five grams of vitamin C into my shake or whatever, um, you could do that, but you might be blunting some of that, your body's natural response to exercise. So that's the only thing with antioxidants. Other than that, if you want to get in some green tea or green tea extract for 
fat burn and weight loss and all this other stuff, it seems pretty effective. Um, I, again, I would just go as natural as you possibly could here, which are the things Ashley hit on. Like, let's just eat some fruits and vegetables. Let's have some legit green tea, non-extract that was thrown into something, um, and get it in the, in the purest form. And it's going to be, uh, way more effective and you know, you're going to get the proper dosing and of high quality. Um, so yeah, just don't overdo it with antioxidants is the only thing there. Yeah. I think taking to the, taking it the days leading up to it is good for you just because, but I mean, that's just eating healthy. If you're just eating balance and having berries and stuff, then you're already getting your antioxidants. That's where you're in prime shape to, uh, for your event. And also one last thing about, uh, tartary juice is that it helps produce melatonin. So you can actually take it like before bed or at least like leading up to bed. Cause it helps you with sleeping and melatonin. Yeah. I heard a little sugar before bed helps, uh, your brain too. Like a small dose of like honey or, huh. I don't know. Just I don't. Well, I've science. only heard honey before bed because of your stomach. I've heard it for your brain, so <laughs> we'll have to. All right, we'll have to find a separate. Yes, we'll have to find that. a study on that one. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, that next down. is caffeine. I don't want to talk a lot about caffeine, um, but we can. <laughs> Everyone else can. Uh, we have. There, here's the reason. We've covered it in episodes 35, 56, and 87. So we've, we've covered go. caffeine in three different episodes um, and for different reasons. <laughs> Each one of those episodes were different reasons or takes on caffeine, whether or not it helps hurt your gains, how it helps your performance pre, post, workout, all these things. And oh, I always say the two most proven and studied um, supplements on the market are going to be caffeine and creatine. That's just it. If I made a supplement, it would probably be caffeine and creatine combination. And I would just call it your pre-workout <laughs> supplement. Uh, but I don't want to make a supplement, so I don't. Um, so anyway, let's talk about caffeine. Anything that you may have pulled from the study or in general want to talk about caffeine? So it seems there's a threshold for caffeine effectiveness. They talked about uh, higher caffeine doses of 9 milligrams per kilogram do not further enhance performance and can result in very undesirable side effects. So it's <laughs> like, it's not like, yeah, I know, right? That's a lot of caffeine anyway. It's absurd but amount. just thinking about... Yeah, just thinking about, like, well, if some is good, then more must be better. That's definitely not how it goes, and that's not a good mentality to have really with anything. But especially with caffeine, caffeine can have some pretty intense side effects if you have too much of it. So it's like there's a threshold here, and they recommend, like, 3 milligrams to 6 milligrams per kilogram um, as your as your dose. Um, and th now these are for, uh, I think the studies they're, recommend or they're referencing here are, like, professional level cyclists uh the studies were done on pro level cyclists and so burning through it you know that's that's pretty much uh where you need to be in the, the activity level you need to be at to have that much caffeine but um anyway it also kind of talked about you could get adapted if you're having daily caffeine you could get adapted to caffeine and you need a higher dose to actually continue the effectiveness of it so um kind of cycling on and off the caffeine can be a good strategy as well so anyway pass it off <laughs> well kyle took all the points but that's okay yep. uh i was just going to say the um for that three to six milligrams per kilogram i'm 155 pounds so it's about 70 kilos and so for me they would want me to take two to four and a half cups of coffee 30 to 90 minutes before training or a race which i drink i drink coffee in the morning i drink at least a cup in the morning and then maybe one later on, but I don't know. Two cups I could pay, probably do, but I can't imagine doing four and a half cups of coffee before training. That's just, I, I that seems a little excessive to me. Um, what did you calculate your cups as? My, uh, they're typically eight ounces. Well, <laughs> I probably drink more than 10 to 12 ounces. That's like uh, typically like, what like, I drink. Like I don't drink an eight wise. ounce cup of coffee. I know that. So like um when I did I did the math for this as well and my range was 260 to 2 to 520 for their 3 to 6 milligrams uh per and for, since I do pour over pour over is a little bit stronger 12 ounce pour over is about 250 milligrams 16 ounces is about 340 but um so that's like the parameters would still only, would be uh right at 12 ounces all the way up till about like 40 some ounces which is a lot pour over yeah 40 <clears throat> ounces of coffee yeah that's good it's also <laughs> yeah it's also 
you have to take into account your activity level, right? Like we're talking to, you know, the title of the series is the weekend warrior. You know what I mean? We're not talking to professional athletes, you know, and again, the studies that they were looking at for those recommendations were for professional athletes. So, you know, the vast majority of us, the amount of, of caffeine we're consuming on a regular basis probably doesn't need to change. Uh, if anything, it might need to go down a little bit, but it probably doesn't need to change very much. And that's what I was going to jump into was just the weekend warrior part of this was it most every event you're going to do is going to start in the morning. And if you drink coffee in the morning, just drink coffee like you normally would. In fact, sometimes I find that these events start so early, it's hard to even have the cup of coffee before you start, but I still try mm -hmm. and find the, the time to do it. Um, so <laughs> caffeine is very important. <laughs> um, then it, it becomes down to if you have a very long event, let's say five plus hours, I would consider caffeine in, somewhere in the middle of that. Small dose, I wouldn't go crazy. And the reason I don't like to get too much into caffeine, because when you really start looking at the science, they do get to some ridiculous um, amounts of caffeine. Doses? It's just, yeah, the yes. dosing is, yep. is just something I think is a little too crazy. Uh, so my only like takeaway of the caffeine, yes, it's effective. It's proven in basically every study on the planet to increase your performance and help you out. But just play with your own dosing. I wouldn't pull the dosing from any scientific study. I would just... Because if you do and you jump to it and you're like, it gives you anxiety or you are super jittery or like, that's what's going to happen. You know, so you just play with your own dosing. You know how much, if you drink caffeine on a regular basis or have caffeine, you're going to know about how much you can take. And if you want to do a little bit more than that, then do a little bit more before an event. Like, I don't think, if you normally have one cup of coffee and you have a cup and a half or two cups before an event, your body's not going to freak out. You know, I think it'll, it'll be fine, yep. but you don't want to go to these like, well, I found some like liquid concentrate caffeine and I'm going to take it before my event, <laughs> you know, like let's stay away from that. Uh, and that's a big reason I stay away from a lot of pre-workout supplements in general is because some of them have like just standard 500 milligrams of caffeine in the, in the serving size. And like, this isn't absurd, like insane. It's just not going to be good for you. Mm -hmm. Um, so the last one that moves us to probiotics. So we just covered this before we started the series, episode 117, and then we also talked about it in general on gut health in episode 31. Uh, so if you want to dive into that anymore, and again, this is three of the four supplements where we're just kind of talking about being healthy. So EO3 elements, just be healthy, and everything will, <laughs> everything will work itself out to include your performance at a high level is going to be kind of the takeaway here for that, but probiotics. I don't know if we need to say much. We did just cover an entire recent episode, but if you, any of you want to jump in with some, some extra stuff. Only thing interesting that I saw, which again, this could be another study to look into was that it helps in upper respiratory infections, Yeah, that's what which I pulled out of it. was mm. pretty cool. And, you know, endurance athletes and athletes themselves suffer more from them because of <laughs> all the training and heavy breathing, I guess, and, and, and uh, stress they put on their lungs. So <laughs> Yeah, that <laughs> would be cool to look into. And if you have any issues like that, then yeah, healthy gut, healthy body, you know, to lower yeah. your inflammations. Talk about travel related illnesses too, which, you know, colds, upper respiratory stuff is probably also included in that. So, um, but again, I'll just hit on your food found in fermented foods. You they even say that buy, uh, like, it seems to eggs. be yeah. the best to just eat fermented food. Exactly. <laughs> just eat stuff. Yeah. Don't take another supplement. <laughs> well, and something they pointed out a lot here as well in this section was for basically this whole study, right? Even going back to the previous two episodes we already did, right? They they are constantly mindful in this study of like GI discomfort, right? And that's why we say one of the main reasons we say like all this stuff, don't try this stuff right before your event. You need to be working it in. And their biggest point, <laughs> the biggest point that stuck out to me here with the probiotics is Keeping your gut healthy is going to lower your GI response to these new things that you're trying. So it's almost like it's kind of a foundation of like you need to have a healthy gut before you start trying all these other things. And it's going to help reduce your GI discomfort. So um, just eat this stuff. Eat the good stuff. Have the probiotics. Have the healthy gut. And all this other stuff will be you'll have less response GI wise. So I think the, you know, this is the supplement section and it's funny because we didn't talk about or advise any supplements. It was just to eat better, which is right. not what people want to hear, but that's just kind of how life is. And it's going to be the easiest way to do it. 
but also just to just to uh end on on it is that um on supplements in general is that a lot of these eating them in general is like that's how your body's going to process it anyway like certain nitrates right. have to combine with your saliva and your stomach acids in order to be that effective compound and same with probiotics it actually has to go through a digestive process you can't hack it with a, a powder or a pill probably because it's probably just going to die in your stomach and you're not going to actually get any benefits even if it's has the cultures outside of it they're not the live cultures that your body is actually going to transform into what it needs so that's just my last bit of the supplement section yeah and they did mention the probiotics and that one really doesn't have a lot to do with like a an exact <clears throat> pre or post this one really and even in their own words was just kind of like general health we're talking about uh upper respiratory infections and things of that nature just being healthy uh in general because what is it the it's the J-shaped curve that we see that we've talked about um, where it's – if you're sedentary, you get this many um, upper respiratory infections. If you train you know, five to ten hours per week, you get half as many as the unhealthy sedentary person, half as many upper respiratory illness and infection. Uh, and then people who train above that threshold are up to double what the sedentary people are. So you actually catch more of these uh, – so uh, more of these illnesses. So – Another thing would just be train an optimal amount. If you're, uh, that's hard for true endurance athletes, uh, but that's not really who's probably listening to this podcast. You're garage gym athletes you're training one to two hours a day, and you're gonna be fine um, at that. So, yeah, hit on those things. Um, I guess we'll quickly cover recovery, nutrition, and uh, the last part there. Um, and this this episode may never end though. So we'll get into uh, recovery, <laughs> nutrition, and. They had a section called Concern with High Carbohydrate Diets. So let's get into it. Nope. Nobody wants to get into it. Um, they, they talked a lot about the recovery window. So like eating things in the proper window surrounding exercise, whether before or after. And um, and they, they talk about how important that is and how it is a real thing. And especially they went back, they jumped back to carbohydrates, uh, which we already covered, but they jumped back to that of getting your carbs in within that recovery window after your training. And so that's really important as well. And making sure that you're timing things properly and after your training and after your event of timing things properly so that your body can utilize them the right way versus just not paying attention to that. And it's just kind of, it's really, it's really interesting how they talk about how the it's all encompassing, right? It's not just leading up to the event. It's not just during the event. They're also talking about recovery. They're also talking about what happens after the event as well and how important it is and how it should be part of your whole plan. So I really like that. Apparently <laughs> caffeine can boost glycogen depletion, which is kind of cool by 66%. By 66%. I was like, yeah, that's significant. Mm -hmm. Yeah, pretty crazy. So it seems like caffeine is a good side thing to have with, uh, what was it, antioxidants and apparently uh, for your glycogen depletion. So just a little bit of that might sprinkle in um, and get fed. Just eat. Don't worry about whatever your macros are. If you're doing an event, it's all about um, recovery. So just eat. I mean, be smart about what you're eating. Still eat good stuff, but you, you don't have a macro plan on race day really it's just getting it in i know jerry talked about it before but after the the bike race when i was there you just like beeline to chick-fil-a just like i just need <laughs> i just need they something. were selling it there and i was like <laughs> yeah. that was the worst i had, had ever felt and i was like this has got to be food related Yikes. like it's got to be and so i don't know if i ate one yeah. or two I, it may have been two versus yeah. two and i ate two chick-fil-a chicken sandwiches and i felt better in like 30 minutes and so yeah I bet. Are we lumping in 3.5 points? Uh, so I'll hit on recovery nutrition real quick. This is a, a principle that I always talk about when we are talking about recovery nutrition. I call it the PR principle or the PR's principle, um, which is protein, rehydrate, and sugar. So talking about recovery in general, those are typically the things that you're looking for. So that post-workout <laughs> window is a real thing, um, but you truly have up to 24 hours. Uh, it's maybe a little bit better if you could do it one to two hours post. Uh, so you want to get the protein in there with enough leucine. We kind of already talked about these things. Uh, rehydrate. So you do want to get, um, like we mentioned, none of us consume water during. So it's very important, though, for me after 
an, a training session to have water or an event, uh, making sure that you're rehydrating, not just with enough water, but also the sodium and electrolytes. And then I mentioned sugar because you do need, it doesn't have to be like a straight form of sugar. I mean, it could be an apple, it could be a banana, whatever, but if you want optimal recovery, you are going to have to do that refeed of the glycogen stores, especially if you have something else coming up. Um, and that's something they mentioned as well. So those things, um, I think liquid IV is again, not a sponsor, but a supplement. It's like noon, but they, they have a lot of sugar. I think it's like 13, 12 grams of sugar or something like that. So I think if you were just looking from something easy game day approach, if you could have liquid IV and a protein drink, like right after you'd probably instantly feel pretty good. You're going to be very hydrated, have sugar, electrolytes, and um, enough protein in there. So those are quick things you can do uh, once the, the race is over. Uh, but yeah, let's jump into 3.5.6, concern with high carbohydrate diets. I found this very interesting for it to be included in a scientific study. Uh, but what did you all think? I think we shared most about... of our feelings during the carb section of that. <laughs> True. True, if we talked about it. I mean, it talks about that Western diet has a lack of fruit and vegetables, and I mean, that's exactly what we just all hit on, right? I mean, every single point of your, of the antioxidants or the probiotics of everything was just your, you know, do this in your diet. Um, and unfortunately, if you are eating a test standard American diet, sometimes you don't get that in your, within your diet. And um, then it talked about training in a low carb state. And, you know, I will be the first to hit this, but it mentioned to do that for grit. And they defined it, they defined grit as mental toughness. And I think we all agree that it was pretty cool that a study even mentioned the word mental toughness mm. in, in the study. But um, yeah, that's my takeaway. Yeah, I think running into that mental toughness tag just kind of put it in my mind as like the greatest study we've ever covered like it's, <laughs> it's definitely one of my favorites but it, it kind of you know the whole the whole thing like as we're coming to the end of it right just the whole this whole study that's there's a reason that we broke it up into three episodes right it's because there's just so much information here and um but to to wrap it all up with hey there's this mental toughness side of it as well so and i think throwing that into they were talking about you know, throwing that into your training as well as can you operate um, through your through your exercise, through your training, through your event? Can you operate on low, you know, lower fuel? Like, can you push through it? Can you still keep going? And uh, can you push through the cold? Can you push through the heat? Can you push through, you know, feeling thirsty when you don't actually need to hydrate? You know, can you push through these types of things? Can you handle these things that are outside of your control and still push through? And uh, so I really, I really liked that. I liked that they threw that in there at the end. I don't. I didn't really find that doing a lower carb diet is a mental toughness thing. I think it's just like saying like train fasted, <laughs> like, and, and I think yeah. that's just important. That's like a big reason why we even program meet yourself Saturday and it's kind of get away from the training and just kind of test yourself and see who you are. So, I mean, I always think that should be a part of your training is yeah. Try to work out when things aren't perfect. You know, um, when you didn't have your, your morning coffee or you didn't have, uh, a meal beforehand or whatever, you know, try these things. I, I wouldn't necessarily try it after the fact, unless you absolutely have to, um, like, yeah, body, I'm going to give you nothing to recover. <laughs> do, <laughs> do what you will. Uh, I just don't think that's the... see, here's a dodgeball yeah. reference when he has the donut and he's going to shock him. I've never seen the movie. I'm, just, I'm oh kidding. My goodness. That was good. <laughs> that was good. Um, oh, anyway, man. so I love the grit mention here too. I think that it's really awesome. And I do think that you should throw those things into your training. Yeah. Like fasted, um, and, and just don't be so perfect all the time. When, when I far, first got to, uh, air force special tactics at the end of my career, a, a lot of the guys kind of knew I was into fitness and, uh, a little bit of nutrition. I was not as healthy as I am today when I was in the military. Um, but I remember them calling me out to, you know, as soon as I got there, they're like, it's guys like you who like will suffer in the field. I'm like, that's offensive. What do you, what do you mean? Uh, and mm -hmm. then, but I wasn't the guy that they, they thought I was, um, <laughs> where like you're counting every macronutrient and like doing everything perfectly all the time, which at that time I wasn't. Um, and so they say that those are the guys who suffer the worst when it comes to game day, like an operation or whatever, and they can't get food or there is no like reinforcements or, or supplies and all these things. 
they say those are the people who get screwed up the most because they they're so used to everything oh i had my this much before you know my my race and i have this after and like i gotta sleep this much and that's not what the military needs you know that and that's why their seal training is the way that it, that it is they want you to get you cold they want you to be sleepy they want you to be hungry and see how you can still operate and so we're not we're not special tactics we're not navy seals that's why i like meet yourself saturday where there's just enough of like in any life situation you get in could you still perform and not have this crutch of like, oh, I didn't have my carbohydrate supplement beforehand. <laughs> like if you needed to carry your child out of uh, the woods because you went on a hike and, and they hurt their leg or something like that, let's not see, you know, it's nothing crazy, but if you had to carry them for long distance, would you be able to? Or if you needed to sprint and run away from um, a person in the city, who, you know, criminal, a bear. Or a bear, you might as well just lay down. Um, <laughs> <laughs> or, you know, yeah, so like an animal, anything, like, if you needed to run, like, you want to make sure that you can still perform in these situations. And I think that was their main thing in the grit and mental toughness part. And I, I really agree with it is, yeah, I want to go into an event and perform my max capacity, but something normally happens that in, in our instance, it was the weather. We couldn't control the weather and it was colder yeah. and wetter than Ooh. we had planned on. And so we were, that was the only thing that really got us. We had a great <laughs> hydration plan, nutrition plan, uh, electrolyte plan. Like that was solid. What we didn't plan for being cold and wet for so whatever, six, eight hours. I don't remember how long that thing was. Um, we were just cold and wet the whole time. But the occasional run that I will do in the winter, in the rain or cold on purpose, you know, gets your mind a little bit primed for like, okay, I can handle myself in this situation. It's not that bad. And uh, a lot of people were quitting that race, like one of the most they had ever seen because people had not prepared for that. They weren't ready for that part. And I think I mean, that's all I want to be prepared for in life. You know, it's like the, that 1% chance that something happens, I want to be ready for it. And I, I want my family to know that I'm ready for that. And, and that should be their expectation. But that's it. Um, we could talk about the book. We could not talk about the book. What do you, should we, should we do it real quick? We can tease it for next week. Yeah. Why don't we just use it for next week? Yeah. That's already been over an yeah, hour. We, yeah, we had a lot to cover in the study. Yeah, but that wraps up the series. So we will cover the book next week. Uh, the book is The Road Less Stupid by Keith J. Cunningham. I really like the book. So, so you have time to read it now. Now they have time to read it for next yeah, week. Yeah, so there, you go. there you go. We told you what the book is. Or listen to it. Well, they made, they're like, I'm going to wait for your barbell rating before I buy it. <laughs> uh, I can true. get mine if you want. But no, it's the same thing. Spoil no, it very much. So... Reading and listening is the same thing. So. Yeah. Oh, gosh. Anyway, we do need to cover the workout real fast. Uh, so The Road Less Stupid, we will cover next week on the podcast. But this week is Stairway to Heaven. I think Ashley is briefing it. So what is the workout? So you've got three different parts of Stairway to Heaven. So part one um, is 20 minutes, and you start at 20 box step-ups every minute on the minute for 20 minutes, so a 20-minute ingom. With a 40-pound vest is the competitor level, established would be 30 pounds, and recruit would be 20. Um, and know that you can scale down even from there if you cannot even do that with a vest. Um, if you're unable to keep pace, you start over with two reps less than your previous attempt until you get to a pace that you can handle for the 20 minutes. So whether that be 18 or 16 or all the way down to 12, whatever it is. Once the 20 minutes is up, you then rest for three minutes, and then you have another 20 minute um, using the exact same pace above where every minute on the minute for 20 minutes, you do, um, 20 box step ups, uh, and the competitors, you are to maintain the box step ups every minute with a 20 pound vest. And then you can scale down from there for establish and recruit. Um, and then it's the exact same thing if you lose your pace and then for you rest another three minutes and then the last part, <laughs> 20 minutes with no vest, you complete 400 box step ups for with a 20 minute time cap, but it is for time. And then it is 300 for established, 200 for recruit. And I think it's funny that we have been talking about um, our yeah. beast time because mm -hmm. this is one that Jared has always recommended if you're doing anything, you know, incline, uphill, any of that, use before Spartans. Um, His hip flexors ready. 
man or and I said make sure you that was my point take care of your hip flexors after this one because holy Moses especially if you haven't been doing lots of box step-ups or anything and your box height is super critical with this one so um if you normally like do 24 inch box jumps I don't necessarily recommend <laughs> doing 24 inch box step-ups take that down um and that's okay and uh is there a crazier version of this in the mix? We're calling it Everest. <laughs> oh no! You know, so I'll, I'll tell the story as quick as quick as I can. I know we're, we're uh, we, we've been long already, but we had this idea to do Everest, a Garage Gym Everest, uh, as a team. And so, if you haven't heard, there's like this was it four six thousand dollar or something event where they they take you to a mm. mountain um, during the <laughs> summertime and then like where like a ski mountain and then you hike up it and then you ride like the lift back down and you just keep going up the mountain until you've um hit cleared the distance of everest and so you keep going up and it's called everesting or something like that if anyone's interested in doing it go go knock mm -hmm. it out and then we're like you know why why pay that much money we could just do this with a box in the garage and <laughs> and joe mentioned well we have to come down the box every time like the, in the Everest event they're just going up the whole time and I thought about that for a while and I was like he's right you know that's a lot of eccentric load like that's going to be hard but then the question came to my mind when you climb Everest do you have to come down you don't have to you could just <laughs> stay there if you want <laughs> you have to come down right like unless you want to yeah. be dead yeah. So the Everest event is yeah. actually really doing a disservice. You're not climbing anything. That's that's silly. Because when people do Everest, <laughs> they go up and they come down. As far as I know, I'm no Everest expert. Maybe there is a ride. Marco. Maybe there's a ride down. <laughs> Maybe there is. Maybe they're like, you just got to come down a little bit. They throw you in the helicopter. They're like, good. Look, man, you made it up. Don't worry about the down. I don't <laughs> think that happens. So I, I am putting Garage Gym Everest back on the table with just... 24 hours of stairway to heaven no vest it has to be base camp because after base camp if there's four point climbing that's like actual tactical mountain climbing and then you repel I mean, down if, if you're so telling me you don't do have to box... come down the mountain i would like to know how you get home <laughs> that's all i'm saying it's the only thing i want to know no but you're not you're not hiking to the actual tip of everest when you do everest because you're actually four point Technical mountain climbing, and then you no, just people don't just down climb up the base camp. If you want to say that you went, you climbed Everest, you got to go to the top. You got to summit, right? Yeah, yeah, hundred percent. Which I know there's technical climbing involved, but there's there's also a down that's, involved. That's the distance. That's so the distance they use in the end. That's the know. distance they use. They use the full height of Everest. They don't just oh, use the the elevation up but to it, base camp. They use. But the Jared whole wanted to get a little technical, so I wanted to get a little technical too. <laughs> I don't think I understand. Anyways, stairway to heaven. <laughs> yeah, so the only tips I have for this one, uh, I think Ashley've already mentioned all of them. Um, hip flexors. <clears throat> I always say start heavy, you know. if you cool. Start heavier than you think that you need to, but, you know, that's it. Scale um, for life on this one. Yeah, I would say, um, I would say maybe try alternating your starting leg each round. So each round you're going like, you'll step up with your right one first and just keep that pace for that whole round. Like you step up with your right one and then back down and all that. But then next round, go with your left one, start with your left one. That way you're or not every other rep because as these, as these, yeah, that's what I do. well, <laughs> if you do every other rep, you know, that would maybe take some extra time. You're but right. Just to think as about this it, goes it, on. Really... Yeah. As this, as this goes on, like you'll get to where you're, not no, stepping no. with great form and you're going to start leaning on your leg and pushing up and all that kind of stuff. And if you're favoring one for the whole thing like that, you know, you're going to be a little, a little lopsided isn't, maybe. It's so. it alternating. I know I'm looking at the write up now, but I thought it was supposed to be alternating anyway, because I've always thought about. Don't take there's... this away from me, Joe. <laughs> that was, a, that was a good tip. <laughs> Cut it out. <laughs> Cause I was going to bring up, because I thought do it was wrong, alternating. guys. Do it wrong. I even, I even thought in the beginning, like, Jared didn't even want you changing legs, alternating at the top. Because if you step on the box, then you can just change legs there. And you go down and bounce up real quick. But you actually have to mm -hmm. change legs at the bottom, which takes longer. 
So I don't know if that was actually a stipulation, but I know I've seen people do it one way or the other. It's definitely faster if you change legs at the top oh, of the box. Top. Yeah, that's what bottom. I do. Or uh, it's so just you don't want us doing that. If you want, you can set up a slide next to your box, and you can step up, so you can is. slide oh down, walk back around, <laughs> step Shut up. It. No, no. Fireman's pole. Yes. This is fireman's pole. Even better. Use your rack. <laughs> yeah. That's not gonna. Yeah. That's not yeah, gonna slide add down the rack. any time. <laughs> Yeah, no, that's not going to add any wasted time. I'm, I'm just, taking, I'm just taking shots at the Everest event. Once I realize you have to come down Everest, I don't understand what they're doing anymore. Um, and I would r- as, rather just go climb Everest or do it in my garage with a box. I mean, as someone who climbed Kilimanjaro, that down was way easier, even though... I know uh, the down's easier. It was sore. But it's there. But it's called gravity. It's there, though. It's, yeah. It, it exists. <laughs> um um, I'm going to go back to the box height just because I always say this when I do athlete briefs, especially like lateral box step ups, you shouldn't be doing 24 inches unless you're like six, four, uh, 20 inch boxes at the, at most, <clears throat> and then scale down from there, you know, stack plates if you need to. Uh, so yeah, just cause you might, you, you want to make sure you are using the top leg and not pushing off with your bottom leg. Cause especially cause, uh, your calf is going to give out way sooner than your hamstring and your glutes to pull you you up. So make sure you're just using the right, uh, the right muscles for it. And this workout I think was designed for you to fail. So just know mm-hmm. that. Yeah. Um, if you're just mentally prepared to fail, then you'll be okay. I, I guess I'm five eleven. did a 24 inch box and it's, that's a lot. It's a lot. That's all I'll say. I think I'd prefer 20 the next time. But I think that's it. All right, that was a lot. Hopefully everyone enjoyed the series. We might do more of these in the future, prepping you for who knows what. I think heart rate training would be the next logical step. Just, we could do five-part series. One zone per episode. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I can't wait to hear what we have to say about the zone one. You're going to have to tell me what zone five is like. Yeah, zone one, we would just sit <laughs> around and stare at each other, and that's basically a zone one podcast. Um, <laughs> All right. Well, that we're in zone one as we uh, we're demonstrating. Um, okay. So that that's it for today. <laughs> Thank you so much for listening and subscribing. So I'm kind of going a different route here. Subscribe to the podcast if you're not. If you found us randomly and you made it to the end, subscribe. If you are a listener to the podcast, please five star review and positive comment. It really does help the show out. Um, there's a lot of podcasts in this fitness section, and and we float to the top and you know middle. We need to be at the very top because come on. Let's be let's be real. We're we're the the truth seekers here. We're putting out the the good information, not the bro science. So, if you want to help in that mission, five star review, positive comment would really help us out. And for all the athletes who are part of the program, we really do appreciate you. If you want to be a part of the programming, go sign up. GarageGymAthlete.com, fourteen day free trial right there. Uh, but that's it for your weekly reminder. If you don't kill comfort, comfort will kill you. Gym Athlete Podcast. If you want to learn more, go to garagegymathlete.com. You can learn about our training. Let us send you a copy of our book, The Garage Gym Athlete, or you can even get featured on the Garage Gym Athlete Podcast. Thanks for listening.